They used to say that cars of the future will be computers on wheels. What they didn't tell us was that our cars would be thinking for us, would be artificially intelligent, self-aware, and nearly indestructible. Oh, wait, that was a TV show from the 80s. <laughs> okay, so maybe our cars aren't modern-day crime fighters like Kit from that classic David Hasselhoff show, Knight Rider, but they are definitely becoming more intelligent over time anticipating our every move, talking to us in a monotone yet soothing voice. Wait, how is this different from Knight Rider again? <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Vehicles are not just computers on wheels these days. No, they are mega computers on wheels that are continuously getting smarter. In today's Chalk Talk, Brian Carlson from NXP joins me to discuss the role that connectivity is going to play in the future of our connected vehicles. How our connected, intelligent vehicles are now being enabled by new service-oriented gateways. And the details of NXP's new S32 G2 vehicle network processors. It's going to make all of this possible. All right, and before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here, Amelia. I know we talked a couple of years ago, and a lot of exciting things have happened since then, so uh, very happy to be here to, to chat with you. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about one of my all-time favorite topics today, intelligent vehicles. But Brian, before we dig into the details, since we're talking about connected intelligent vehicles, can you talk about the role the cloud plays in these kind of designs? Sure. So this is actually one of the key areas in the new digital transformation of vehicles. You know, in the past, vehicles have had processors that talk to each other within the vehicle. And there's been some connectivity, you know, for your audio, your, your video, and your maps, you know, those types of services. But what's happening now is that the cloud is becoming an extension of the vehicle. It's providing cloud services. It's receiving a lot of vehicle data. And it's providing new services inside the vehicle through over-the-air updates. So the cloud is really fundamental to uh, enabling all these new capabilities we keep hearing about, these mega trends about autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. Those types of vehicles need to have the ability to improve over time. And that's what's really new here. The cloud is fundamental to provide that capability to update those vehicles, which can make them more intelligent, safer, more secure, higher efficiency for like electric vehicles, extending the range over time and providing new capabilities and services so you get these improved services. So what you see is vehicle data that goes up to the cloud from the vehicle, and that provides a lot of insights into what's going on. Based on that, we can create new types of algorithms in the cloud. Everyone talks about machine learning today, and that, that extends into automobiles. Using machine learning in the cloud to really understand what's going on and making that vehicle better through machine learning, and then updating it with over-the-air services. So it's really a cycle, and we'll get more into that, I think, as we talk further. But this is the basis of what this is about. It's about a connected vehicle that's intelligent. Okay, so Brian, what are the key problems we're looking to solve here? Yeah, so as we move forward, and this world is really becoming a software-driven world, data-driven, that's a key driver for where these automobiles need to go. But at the same time, the way vehicles are designed today are adding a new box. You may hear about electronic control units or ECUs. The path that we've been on for, for decades has been to keep adding a new ECU, which is another computer, into the vehicle. And we finally reached the point in the last five years or so where that's not working anymore. It just doesn't scale. The amount of wires that's required, the complexity of adding more boxes and more weight, it's really becoming a burden on the automotive industry, even in the manufacturing of it, because they're having trouble taking these two, three-inch thick bundles of cables of wires, putting them through the door. They're even heating those to manufacture these vehicles. So that's the key problems that they have. Now, at the same time, there are some new opportunities. We're addressing the challenges and creating new opportunities. 
And the basis of doing that is a combination of the hardware platform or the processing within the vehicle with new types of software for a software platform and going back to the original point that the cloud is now fundamental to these new connected intelligent vehicles going forward. So it's really a combination of those three. Now, with this being software driven, new software uh, can be used to, to download, to improve the vehicles over time. The processors in these platforms, these hardware platforms are becoming much more capable with multiple cores and new software architectures that allows the automakers to consolidate functions into these more powerful computing boxes. So you may hear about ECU consolidation, that's getting rid of dozens of boxes you know, today, could be in the range of 30, 30 of these ECUs in a vehicle, go on to 150 plus in some high-end vehicles. What we're seeing is the trend to consolidate those boxes into software, into more powerful boxes, and only a handful of boxes, most likely. So it's solving both of those challenges of being able to support the needs of these new types of vehicles. It's software-driven, it's data-driven, and addresses the problems or challenges. But at the same time, and probably the most exciting part about it is that now you have access with these new architectures to the vehicle data, which is enabling new capabilities, new opportunities to create new services and use those over the air updates to basically make your vehicle more intelligent over time. And that's, that's what's really exciting about it. Absolutely. Now, Brian, can we talk a little bit about how exactly data is dealt with between the vehicle and the cloud? Yeah, it's a great question because, as I mentioned, data is really driving this whole process. And there's a whole vehicle data lifecycle, which includes the machine learning aspect, both in the cloud and on the edge. So if we look at these new vehicles and all the sensors that are coming into them, you know, we see dozens of cameras and radar, LIDAR, GPS for localization positioning, IMUs for motion, you know, accelerometers and understanding the motion of the vehicles. All of those sensors combined with a lot of other data within the vehicle that's created, it really generates terabytes of data per vehicle per day. So that's what we're dealing with. Now, realistically, you can't send all of that data to the cloud, right? It's just not economical. It's more data than even 5G can process. The 5G cellular networks go a long way, but you're not going to send everything to the cloud. And that's where these vehicle processing platforms come into play and what NXP specializes in. So it's called the intelligent edge software, edge processing, right? We're looking at all of that data to process locally without having to send all of that data up to the cloud and to be able to really only send the data that's required. So once that edge processing is done on these vehicle platforms, that data is streamed up to the vehicle, it's ingested by the cloud, and there's multiple cloud vendors that buy these services. So it could be a, a public cloud, uh, like an AWS, a Microsoft Azure, or it could be the OEMs could have their own cloud or some type of hybrid between a public and, and private clouds. But once that data is in the cloud, the data is processed, it's enriched, it's analyzed, it's stored into these massive storage areas called data lakes within these servers in the cloud. But once it's there, that data can be processed with thousands of processors and GPUs that are optimized to do machine learning. And this is what's really important to be able to leverage that cloud for the processing and storage capabilities to improve the functions of the vehicle. So in real time, bringing data to the cloud, storing that off, and then on the back end, that data can be processed by these data scientists that are experts in processing massive amount of data and learning about what that data means and improving the functions of the vehicle. So once they have a model that is improved, that can be deployed back to the vehicle. As I mentioned about over-the-air services or OTA services, that's deployed back to the vehicle and that processing can be done within the actual gateway itself that we'll see or any of those ECUs or computers within the vehicle. So it, it really is a cycle of lots of data from the vehicle, working on that intelligently, processing it in the cloud, and then deploying these machine learning models back to the vehicle. It's really a, a cycle that involves that hardware on the vehicle, the software that runs on it, and the cloud working together. 
That makes sense. Now, Brian, it seems like just a couple years ago, we were only dreaming of vehicles like this. What do you think are the kinds of improvements that are coming along with these connected, intelligent vehicles? Yeah, and this is what's really exciting about it, because now that we process that data through the whole life cycle, this could be used literally across the vehicle And that's what's so important to having access to all of the vehicle data to enable those capabilities. So if we look at a few examples, like the electric vehicle, you know, it's a very important topic today. We're we're trying, you know, to to conserve energy, reduce the carbon footprint. That that goes a long way, but you know, there's always the concern about the range of an electric vehicle. The key thing there is higher energy efficiency and smarter battery management that extends the range of those vehicles. And that can be done through this whole life cycle I just showed by improving the algorithms, extending the range. So that goes a long way to improve electric vehicles. On autonomous vehicles or advanced driver assistant type systems that come before that we're seeing today moving towards more and more autonomous vehicles, those can be improved too. So when there are new types of situations where you see pedestrians or cyclists or animals or detecting how the motion of vehicles being done or updating high definition maps to help guide your journey, improving the driving algorithms. Basically overall, we're improving that autonomous vehicle with this process also because it gets smarter over time, the whole driving experience is better. But overall, those capabilities can be applied to the vehicle. You know, we can create new user experiences. Uh, we can monitor the, the health of the vehicle. And that can actually, with these machine learning algorithms, we're showing today that it can detect problems within the vehicle before that check engine light comes on, right? You don't want to be stranded on the side of the road. This is actually a very hot topic today is monitoring the health of the vehicles to notify the driver that there's a pending issue that needs to be serviced. It really helps that that user experience there. Another big area in the vehicle is insurance offerings. We're seeing a whole new range of insurance products and services being offered based on access to this vehicle data, whether it's for usage-based insurance where I pay a certain price per trip based on where I'm driving, my driving behavior, or even new types of insurance offerings like electric vehicle insurance. That's an exciting new area because the value of that vehicle is actually based on the battery. The battery is a huge part, over 30% of the cost of that vehicle. So depending on the driving style and how that EV is being used and the status of the battery, that can define the value of the battery. So that now gives the insurance companies the ability to understand what is the value of that vehicle at every point in time. Or for a fleet of vehicles, they know the value of their fleet at one point in time, and they can determine if they want to sell the vehicle, start leasing the vehicle. It gives them options on what that value is. But probably the most important areas are in the area of safety and security, right? These are devices that can be dangerous. If they can kill people, they can be in accidents. We want to make these safety, right? The ultimate goal is to prevent the 1.3 million deaths a year across the world. So we can improve the safety of the vehicles. We can add more capable driving assistance capabilities, more and more autonomous capabilities to get the driver out of the loop and to prevent the 93% plus of accidents that are actually due to human error. So that's going to be really important going forward. And of course, security. These are connected vehicles, so that's always a question we get. Okay, if we're connected, now there's a a larger attack footprint. We need to be able to monitor what's going on in the vehicle and then update that vehicle over time to address any potential software vulnerabilities. Because we're talking hundreds of millions of lines of code going forward. And software, there always will be issues in software that will have to be updated So all of these come together to really improve the vehicle over time. So when you buy a vehicle, it's actually going to be the worst that it is when you buy it off the lot. When you go forward, the connected intelligent vehicle gets smarter and gets better over time. And that just flips the equation of today, right? Today, it's the best you get is, is when you get it off the lot. It's the opposite. So what we're doing here, these key enablers, are the vehicle edge processing, that machine learning I was talking about, leveraging the cloud and using those over-the-air updates to bring it all together and to update those vehicles uh, over time. Okay, so Brian, since the title of today's Chalk Talk is the gateway to connected intelligent vehicles, how exactly does the gateway come into play? 
great point, and that's what we, you know, kind of leading up to the whole background, and this is what the real focus is going forward. If you look at this diagram here, the service-oriented gateway, which is central to the vehicle, it has access to all the parts of the vehicle or the domains of the vehicle, and it has secure connectivity to the cloud. That is what is key, and that's why it is the gateway to these new connected intelligent vehicles, because it provides all of those access to the data, the ability to have processing to run services in the vehicle, and the ability to really enable the, what we've been talking about so far today. So these service-oriented gateways are actually new. In the past, these have been generally a, a microcontroller that was just moving data securely from one part of the vehicle to the other. It really didn't have a lot of processing to do any type of services that we're talking about here. It had some over-the-air updates, but not vehicle-wide over-the-air updates. And it had some processing, but not enough edge processing to support all the data uh, analytics and, and uh, other data processing that's required to implement these connected intelligent vehicles. And this really drove the need for a new type of automotive processor, which is what we've introduced called the S32G2 vehicle network processors to be able to realize all of these capabilities that we've been talking about. Okay, so Brian, can you explain a bit about the processing going on here? What are we really looking at when it comes to processing and networking? Yeah, so the service oriented gateway really becomes a centralized vehicle compute. And it has a lot of requirements to not only provide those services that I've been talking about or just the gateway functions that I was talking moving data, but there's a lot of processing, very different types of processing, heterogeneous processing that has to go on in the service oriented gateway. I typically break this down into three areas there's real time aspect or real time processing of all that data that's coming through the, the gateway, right? It's working with multiple, what we call CAN networks that have data that go across the vehicle. So it has to be able to process that data in real time. It needs to, in addition to that, be able to move the data from one part of the vehicle to another. As a gateway processor, it has to interface with multiple sensors, monitor the safety of the vehicle, and also provide that ECU consolidation that I mentioned before. A lot of those ECUs are doing real-time control where they need to have a processor or a microcontroller that is very fast and can be deterministic in a, to real-time events. Now, the other side of that is the application processing. These are not so much real-time necessarily. The big thing here is to run a high-level operating system like Linux uh, to be able to do very large applications with lots of storage. And these are the types of applications that are communicating with the cloud, providing vehicle services I've been talking about, as well as managing all those over-the-air updates, not only within the gateway, but throughout the vehicle. And then all that data that comes in that's being pre-processed on the real-time side, more intelligence can be put on top of that to do more data analytics. It can run machine learning models. And as I mentioned, we can't send everything to the cloud. So you need to do intelligent processing, data reduction, processing a lot of the Ethernet traffic that goes across the vehicle, whether it's routing or firewalling or doing deep packet inspection consolidating, again, some of the higher-level ECU functions, and then basically providing processing for the future so new applications could be downloaded or new services could be downloaded onto this platform through the life of the vehicle. But all of this has to support a secure environment. So on top of that, integration of security is a must-have, right? It, security is fundamental. As part of that, you have to support trusted boot, a whole chain of trust because we need to make sure that whatever software is loaded or running on this platform is trusted and not coming from a unauthorized source. So that includes cryptography, supporting authentication, secure services, and also managing all of the keys within the vehicle that enable new capabilities and make sure that those capabilities are coming from those authorized services. So it's quite a lot of processing that has to come together. On top of that, all of the networking with the CAN, as I talked about, the Ethernet interfaces, there's a tremendous amount of things that have to be done. Okay, so Brian, what are we talking about when it comes to performance? 
Yeah, so this is where it gets interesting because if you look at historically, and as I think we talked a couple of years ago about state of the art back then, and we were talking in the range of 1,000 DMIPS. This is a microcontroller world, and it really didn't do all these services. It, it had to move data, but it was you know slower CAN data. It was maybe some 100 megabit Ethernet. But now this new world, the service-oriented world, porting these connected intelligent vehicles that have to do autonomy, that have to do electrification, they require a lot more processing. So we're talking at least 10x. So it's a 10x for the processing, 10x from the networking as we move from the 100 megabit to gigabit Ethernet. And now we're seeing multiple of those. So it's literally more than 10x. It's a tremendous amount of new processing and networking requirements. And on top of that, we always have to talk about safety, right? This is a vehicle. It has to be safe. And we're seeing as we move to more autonomous or um, assisted driving types of systems, that safety becomes even more important. The ability to recover from a fault and to fail what we call operational. So if the car is driving down the road, the ability to still be able to run in some mode of operation, not just stop in the middle of the road. That's a good example of why we need more safety and to recover from faults. And of course, security, as I mentioned, security is very important, especially with communication with the cloud. Uh, You need to leverage more advanced cryptography than what's been used in automotive before. A key part of that is the public key infrastructure using private uh, and public keys, having attack resistance against side channel attacks from hackers. Again, being a connected vehicle, you need to have more comprehensive and advanced security. And all of these have to come together to support these new service-oriented gateways. Okay, so given those metrics you just mentioned, what kind of solution should I be looking for? Yeah, so bringing all that together is what the challenge has been. And there has been recently people putting together two chips. You know, we talked about there's the real-time support that you need. There's the application part, right? There are existing chips today that can do both of those. But again, it's two separate chips. It's not optimized for high-speed communications between those. It's not optimal solution. It won't have the ASIL-D typically across both the real-time and application processing, and it can't support all of those applications. So What we need is a new type of automotive processor that brings all of those capabilities into a single device. And that's what NXP calls the vehicle network processor. Three key areas. The processing, really important because, again, as we showed, the real-time processing is very unique from the application processing. So it's different types of processors. So the SA2G2 is based on ARM processors, which is really important. There's a large ecosystem of ARM software developers. And as we're becoming a software-driven world, having access to lots of software developers that have lots of expertise on it is very important. So we made a shift to the ARM world in this area. So we have ARM microcontrollers, which are Cortex-M7s, and we have microprocessors, which are the ARM cortex a 53 Now, what's unique here is that those microprocessors can run in what's called a lockstep mode. So there's actually redundancy. And this is unique to this device, um, having the ability to not only have redundancy in in the real time, but to have redundancy on the application processing, right? It's, again, going back to higher level of safety. Now, on top of all the processing, I talked about there's a lot of interfaces throughout that vehicle, right? We're central to the vehicle. There's lots of interfaces to all those different domains. There's a lot of Ethernet coming in, right? This is the 10x plus of more data bandwidth that has to be required. So what we have found and what customers were saying is that they were not able to process that amount of data with the traditional microcontroller path. And even with a microprocessor, it can load microprocessors down So what we did is bring together some network acceleration technologies, leveraging our expertise that goes way back to the Motorola and Freescale days in the enterprise and, you know, the core internet types of acceleration of the networks. And we saw this about 20 years ago, actually, as the the internet was really growing, we saw the same kind of shift from a processor to a processor plus network acceleration. And we've been doing this for decades. So we brought that technology into the automotive world. We combined that with all these networking interfaces, the 20 CAN interfaces, the support for four gigabit Ethernet interfaces, 
and PCI Express to really address all those requirements to meet the real-time processing, the application processing, and servicing all of that vehicle data through the networks. And again, safety and security is important, being able to support the highest level of functional safety, as well as having a hardware security engine embedded that allows us to support the public key infrastructure and resistance against hacking attacks. And we're finding this processor is very popular in a lot of applications. It really was targeted for these service-oriented gateways, but we're also seeing it being used throughout the vehicle in these different applications. Okay, so how would someone start to work with this new automotive processor? Yeah, so as we move forward, these types of designs do require a lot of enablement to make it easy for our customers to build their products. And I had a comment by a customer the other day, in fact, that I thought was interesting. He says, you know, this this chip, this S32G2, it literally takes all the component on the board of my current product and it puts it into one processor. So that was a really interesting thing. It shows you it reduces the complexity of designs and costs. But because of that, you do need enablement to make it easier to design with. So from an NXP perspective, we look at this holistically. We work across the company with different solutions that will interface with the S32G2 processor, including all the interface transceivers, the Ethernet switch, and the power management device, as well as uh, other processors around it that can provide additional capabilities. So we have a complete solution. And that is actually put into real world, not just saying we have a list of parts that work together, but we do have hardware platforms, including our reference design, the RDB2 and uh, the new Gold Box. That provides a true reference design that our customers can use schematics, layout, bill materials, all that information comes with it. That gives them a fast track to design their hardware. And we have partners like Microsys that offers a single board computer with a module in the middle of that called a SOM, System on Module. It's the size of a business card. So customers can take the SOM, put it into their own form factor, into their own product, and move very quickly to market with a modular approach. Now, as I mentioned, it's a software world, right? It's more and more software, hundreds of millions of lines of code within the vehicle, so software becomes really important. So we've worked across the ecosystem to provide support for both the application side, the real-time side for high-level operating systems, real-time operating systems, hypervisors, all the tools that are required to develop with and to debug, as well as a lot of really interesting application layers that allow us to do those vehicle health monitoring over the air updates. So we have this comprehensive ecosystem to allow customers to go to market quickly from the software side. And this shows a list of our partners uh, from the top level, from the cloud, through the applications, through the software environment, and down to the tools and boards. So all of this comes together with an NXP software tools development environment called S32 Design Studio. So really this provides an end-to-end offering for our customers to move very quickly with the S32G2. Now, Brian, that ecosystem seems like it would be important not just to car makers, but to also other players in this design arena as well. Yes, I agree. And this is actually what we're seeing. The intent originally was for development for our customers to provide new capabilities very quickly with S32G. But what we found out is that there's a whole ecosystem beyond the car makers that could leverage this platform. So what we're seeing from the car makers, first of all, is this gives them a fast path to be able to start doing their proof of concepts, doing capture of data, trying new services. It gives them a really nice sandbox to play in to start to develop these new intelligent connected vehicles very quickly. But It goes beyond that because there's this whole ecosystem. And as the automotive industry is changing, it's not the linear model of the past where we would provide a chip to a tier one, they would design a box like the ECU and develop software on that box and then to provide that to the OEM automaker. It's really become kind of a matrix, everyone working together. It's a collaborative effort across the industry now. So there's a lot of application developers that are coming into automotive I would say even from other markets like uh, servers and and enterprise markets that have really interesting innovations like different types of security. And they want to bring those into the automotive market and work with the automotive tier ones and OEMs. So we're seeing this platform also being used by those companies to bring innovation into automotive to be able to showcase 
their capabilities to the uh, automotive industry. And then the new thing that's really exciting is the addition of the cloud and service providers. Because in the past, a box like this, as I mentioned, is more working within the vehicle, but now we're connected to the cloud and that opens up a lot more opportunities working together in a symbiotic compute doing those over-the-air updates to be able to deploy new capabilities, to deploy new machine learning and new services to the vehicle. So it really is overall accelerating this whole digital transformation across the automotive ecosystem. Okay, Brian, can we circle back to the edge for a bit? Can you explain a bit more about the interchange between the cloud and the gateway? Yeah, so the, these connected vehicles have to work very closely with the cloud, as we were talking about earlier. And in the vehicle, it's that service-oriented gateway that's key to providing kind of the central functionality and the secure connectivity to the cloud. So within that service-oriented gateway, this is where those vehicle services are run. This is where all of those terabytes of data is coming uh, and being processed to reduce the amount of data. Because as we mentioned, we don't send all the data. We, we need to be an intelligent edge. So the, the service-oriented gateway is doing that front-end processing. It's filtering the data. It's finding the data that's really needed that has value to the cloud. It reduces the amount of data. And in some cases, we're seeing more uh, regulations where we need to store data kind of like a black box within the vehicle. So in that case, you need to be able to have a centralized place to store vehicle data. But in the end, when working to the cloud, it's about securely transmitting that process data up to the cloud. So it would be vehicle data, the edge results up to the cloud. And then the cloud has thousands of servers available to process that data. It can scale very quickly depending on the demand. It ingests that data and it does its processing to enrich it, to analyze the data. And that can feed into ultimately the data lake, which can be used to mix in with business intelligence data, other operational data from the supply chain, from marketing, from design. That enables a, a lot of enterprise level capabilities, uh, including using that data for machine learning that we talked about earlier. So it can look all that data, understand the data and develop models that can better react to that data real time in the vehicle. So it's really about ingesting the data and processing and storing it, and then based on that data, doing over-the-air updates back to that vehicle, which could be new services, it could be new machine learning models, or just managing that vehicle. So it ties back to that loop I showed. It's kind of the next level of detail that, that shows what's happening under the covers. Okay, I understand now how the gateway and cloud work together, but how does the gateway interface with the rest of the vehicle? Yeah, so the Gold Box or the Service Oriented Gateway has all those interfaces that I mentioned, like CAN, LIN, FlexRay, and lots of Ethernet interfaces. So as shown in the overall diagram, that Service Oriented Gateway is central to the vehicle. So it has those connections. And what NXP has done is leverage our expertise in the autonomous drive, ADAS area with high-performance compute, with what we call the NXP Blue Box, and our expertise in vehicle control, electric propulsion, battery management with a box we have called the green box. And those work together to provide that end-to-end -end vehicle is, is a great example of how the different systems can work together, working through the service-oriented gateway and working to the cloud, providing data and then receiving over-the-air updates, machine learning updates, that whole cycle so we're extending it beyond just the gateway. We've extended it across the vehicle to the two other key areas. And this also can leverage with the infotainment or the body and control. There's other functional um, areas of the vehicle that it can also work with. But this shows a good example of the three major functions and some of the use cases that it can enable, like the predictive maintenance, that usage-based insurance, really understanding what's going on in the vehicle, managing a fleet of vehicles, upgrading the vehicles, improving that autonomous driving, improving the range of the electric vehicle, and really understand how the vehicle is being used to, that the OEM finds really important to, to get those types of analytics of how their vehicles are being used so they can continually improve and focus on those areas that matter most to their customers. And then another area where we're starting to see very important here is the area of public safety or smart cities. Because of all the data across that vehicle, you can leverage those connections through the service-oriented gateway to the cloud to really provide a lot of intelligence to these smart cities and to public safety. 
Now, Brian, I'm especially interested in electric vehicles. Can we talk about that management system for a bit? Yeah, electric vehicles is an exciting area. And if you look at the growth, it's been tremendous even over the last year and a half. Uh, If we look forward over the next nine years, uh, by 2030, it's predicted that half the vehicles that are sold will be EVs, and that's going to accelerate very quickly. So we see electric vehicles as being a key area to be able to support through connectivity to the cloud. So what we did is we worked with AWS, which has a whole cloud system in place called the Connected Mobility Solution, or CMS. And we leveraged the expertise that we had within the vehicle, the intelligent edge processing we talked about with the gateway, and then our expertise in the electrification and powertrain domain control area. So we brought all of this together in a complete solution where the green box is monitoring the batteries, it's monitoring the energy management, and it's driving the dual electric motors. And that secure traffic, uh, the data that comes from the green box and the data that goes to the green box uh, from the service oriented gateway is connected to that AWS connected mobility solution that gives you the whole visualization and control of what's going on in the vehicle. So giving you the ability to manage those electric vehicles. So the value propositions this is offering is really optimizing the energy usage, extending the range, and continually improving that EV, which is really important because the EVs, we want to make them have longer lives, the battery lasts longer, and we want them to have extended range to keep consumers happy. So we brought all these technologies together. We support the use cases we've been talking about, and it provides an N10 solution that shows the reality of how you can make a very connected, intelligent vehicle around the electric vehicle area. And there's a link here, and there's a video that goes through that. You can actually watch the vehicle drive in real time and monitoring that in the cloud. So it's a really exciting new area for electric vehicles. Excellent. Now, I heard NXP is involved in the Fusion Project, which is related to intelligent connected vehicles. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so we recently, in the last month, we've been working over a year with a consortium of four other automotive industry partners, realizing that one company doesn't have all of the expertise or the technologies necessarily to bring together an entire implementation of that data lifecycle that I showed earlier, right? That whole cycle from the intelligent edge to the cloud and then back through over the air update. So what we did is, in consistent with the model I showed, the hardware, the software platform, the cloud platforms, we brought all those together with these key partners. So we worked with Airbiquity for the over-the-air updates, Cloudera for the cloud data platform that allows us to provide the secure data from the platform, the vehicle platform up to the cloud and to have access to the services in the cloud to analyze the data and do machine learning. NXP is providing the hardware platforms, those vehicle processing platforms. And in this case, we're actually showing the gold box and blue box. So this is the initial implementation or use case for this Fusion project was to show the data lifecycle that runs with advanced driver assistance or EDAS system using the NXP blue box, securely working through the gold box for intelligent edge processing, and then working with the cloud. And we leveraged Taraki also for the machine learning capabilities, the reduction of the data, and then WinRiver for system software uh, and Linux capabilities that run on the platform. So we really have this fully integrated solution. Now, what's exciting about this is bringing kind of the best of the best in these different areas of that life cycle together. And it gives us a system that can be used in production vehicles. And that's what's really new about the Fusion project. You know, people are doing some of this today, but they're not typically taking it to the level beyond initial test vehicles, right? They don't have the ability to do this cost effectively within production vehicles. They typically have a rack of equipment. It's too expensive, too much power that just doesn't scale to production vehicles. And that's what's really important with this. In the process of doing what we're doing and and leveraging the intelligent edge, we're able to reduce the amount of traffic, substantially increase the efficiency of the whole process, and to provide a lot of value propositions. And at the end of the day, the, the customer gets an open platform that they're able to have flexibility to leverage the data in the way they want to. It's not a black box solution And it's a solution that scales to production vehicles. And those are two very important points of how we're implementing that data lifecycle. Okay, that sounds great. 
But what are we really talking about in terms of performance here, Brian? Yeah, so one of the key benefits that came out of this type of collaboration is the ability to really not only accelerate the process of doing this machine learning and data lifecycle, but at the end of the day, we can do it cost effectively because we're reducing the amount of data over 98%. And it depends on the use case and the amount of data, but typically between 75 and 98%, where we can take a lot of that data that's in the car, look at the data that really makes sense, that, that is really needed to train these machine learning models in the cloud, and are able to get model accuracy over 99%, which is what you need in automotive. And at the same time, and this is what a huge benefit is, to be doing it 10x, and I've seen uh, much more than that, where in the cloud, machine learning models is a very complex process involving thousands of processors, uh, where it could take days, actually days, to, to process the data. And we're able to show where we've reduced days down to hours with this process in some cases. So it does provide significant amount of benefits, not only in the amount of data and the cost efficiency, again, going back to, you need to be able to do this in production vehicles, right? To make those connected intelligent vehicles get smarter over time. It's not just doing a test vehicle to create a one-time machine learning model, but that car gets smarter, just like a child does, right? As a child grows up, it learns, it evolves, and it gets smarter over time. That's what this is enabling but it's enabling it to be cost efficient in production vehicles and to be a much faster process. It comes back to leveraging expertise across the industry to bring up those capabilities together. Okay, great. Well, this has been a lot to take in today. Brian, can you recap your main points for me? Yeah, sure. And, and I know it's a lot. And it's been a lot of uh, technologies and architectures and, and changes that have evolved very, very quickly over the last I would say last two years, this has been happening very, very quickly. Bottom line, though, is that these vehicles are becoming smarter over time. So they're connected. That's the key thing, as I mentioned. Being connected, having access to the cloud, connected uh, intelligent vehicles are leveraging that cloud. And these service-oriented gateways are really key to enabling them. They are the gateway to connected intelligent vehicles, providing central access to the complete vehicle, providing that local processing and storage and secure connectivity to the cloud. They're getting more intelligent. The key thing there also is the ability to do these over-the-air updates, whether you're adding new capabilities, you're improving the performance of the vehicle, the accuracy of the vision processing for, for assisted driving or autonomous vehicles or the efficiency of an EV. At the same time, you can use this whole life cycle for improving the features of the vehicle, adding new capabilities, and as I always go back to, safety and security are paramount in vehicles, having the ability to update those. The S32 G2 processors, the vehicle network processors from NXP, are really targeted at this application. They provide the combination of the real-time application processing and security to make service-oriented gateways a reality. And as we showed, we have the ecosystems, a, a large range of partners that are providing platform, software, cloud infrastructure, and even collaborations across partners to provide complete solutions to really enable these connected intelligent vehicles, which, which are the future of, of automotive. Excellent. Well, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me again, Brian. Excellent. Thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoyed talking with you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.